Welcome to the School of Resistance edition number eight, the paranoia of the Western mind. The School of Resistance is a bi-weekly think tank produced by IFPM and Ente Gent in cooperation with the Academy of the Arts, the Bundeskulturstiftung, Medico International and others. The today's edition is a co-production uh, with Steirischer Herbst, uh, curated by the wonderful Ekaterina Diegot and David Riff. The School of Resistance live stream uh, was created during the first lockdown last May, and perhaps it's due to this moment, only some weeks after the oil price fell under zero for the first time in human history because of the cut of the global supply chains, that one question became central in all our debates. What comes after the oil, war and exploitation driven Western age, the so-called capitalism or now neoliberalism? What comes after the European centered capitalist universalism? What are alternatives to make the world habitable again, to construct and tell different new stories about our future and our common past? non eurocentered stories, perhaps even non-anthropocentric stories. Since May, we had very interesting and also very different philosophers and intellectuals from all over the world with us. For example, the Cuban artist Tanya Bruguera or the South African performer Nora Chipaumire, the Indian philosopher, ecologist and activist Vandana Shiva and the Ugandan activist Vanessa Nakate, the Croatian philosopher Serge Gohovat or 10 days ago, the Canadian philosopher Alexis Shotwell and the founder of Extinction Rebellion, Gail Bradbrook. Today we have with us the historian and philosopher Ashim Bembe. Bonjour, Ajil. Thanks for being here uh, with us today. It's a big honor and, and, and pleasure. Ashim Bembe is, I think, the kind of personality you don't have uh, to present. According to the Goethe Institute, the, I quote, most influential African historian and philosopher of our time. Bembe was born in uh, Cameroon and is best known for his books about the after effects of colonialism like De la Postcolonie, Critique de la Raison Negre, Politique de l'Inimité, and uh, Necropolitics, all translated in many, many languages, of course, including also German. Uh, his last book, Barbarisme, uh, who, who is co-writing with uh, Felvin Sarr, uh, will be uh, translated soon at Surkamp. Uh, Edition House also to German. Uh, Ashim Wembe worked at the Paris Sorbonne University, at the Columbia University in Berkeley, Chail, Harvard, and Duke University. And he currently lives and works in Johannesburg as professor at the Witwatersrand University. But he is known all over the planet as public philosopher. Together with Selvin, Selvin Sarr again, he is the co founder of Atelier de la Pensee uh, in Dakar. We will come back. Uh, to this think tank. Our discussion will lead us in the next hour to topics like the global and European border regime, the post-colonial post situation, and more generally, the political economy of our time uh, and members' term of necropolitics as the neoliberal sovereignty over life and death, and how this is linked to statehood, violence, and the colonial past. I hope that we will find time after talking about the state of our world in times of COVID, a state of unprecedented segregation and exploitation about the more utopic perspective on what has to be done to stay alive as humanity, as biosphere, as a planetary society. But I want to start uh, as announced from a very specific point from an affair that happened last spring in Germany It became the so-called Ashir and Bembe affair. When we announced your invitation to this talk, Ashir, many people were immediately thinking about it. And uh, when we were talking about it before, it already seemed a bit historic to me, like a long time ago, because it was, I think, in March. And now we have uh, October. And I will try to give a short expose to all non German listeners before we start to talk about this affair. So in spring, summer, early summer 2020, Ashim Bembe was to give the opening speech of the then cancelled Ruhr Triennale, the biggest German arts festival at this time, but there were protests against this invitation as uh, Bembe was accused of relativizing the Holocaust by comparing it to the violence in the former colonies and another issue, comparing the state of Israel to the apartheid system in South Africa. 
accusations that were based on some completely decontextualized lines of your books, mainly Politique de, Limit, uh, de Limité and the last book translated in German and Brut Brutalism was not in so far. The accusations turned like many debates in our time of excommunications and vilifications on the one hand quite fast out to be strategically made up to dismiss the artistic director of the Ruhr Triennale, Stephanie Karp, who invited you and thoroughly insisted on your invitation. But hopefully Mrs. Karp was not dismissed. Uh, but this is, I think, the unpleasant and not so interesting side of the, of the affair. Because on the other hand, a complex debate started. Once again, the so-called post-colonial perspective known for its transhistorical comparison of political and especially colonial strategies of exclusion and genocidal violence clashed with a perspective centered on the incomparability of the inner European genocide, the so-called Holocaust. And even if uh, your writings are still were misread, decontextualized to create the scandal where hardly could be found one, I was asking myself at this uh, very moment and also preparing this uh, discussion, what does this tell us about the German or the Western mind and in its impossibility to recognize a non-European comparativism? What does this tell us about the memory politics of the West? Why can't you understand that as Hannah Arendt wrote, the genocidal violence of European totalitarianism in the 20th century has its roots or is a kind of a re-import of the genocidal violence in the colonies of the same European powers in the 19th century. That racism, capitalism, and even what we call democracy are historically linked concepts. But first, let me ask, uh, how was this affair, this Achille Bembe affair for you? How much were you involved or was it mostly a German affair? You didn't really grab the reasons. In your letter to the Germans, you wrote as, a, as one of your answers in the Taz die Tageszeitung, you, you wrote, I translated it, Germany must decide for itself whether it wants to hear the voices of others or whether it wants to turn its back to them. Are there misunderstandings you think could be fruitful to design what I would call the paranoia of the Western mind, the paranoia to become also only a voice under others, uh, as you write in, I think, Brutalism, a province in the globalized world. How did you live this, uh, this and how do you remember this affair? Look, uh, I woke up one morning uh, <clears throat> in Johannesburg, uh, only to hear that uh, I was accused, as you, you said, of uh, anti-Semitism, of uh, relativizing the Holocaust, and of being anti-Israel. At first, I thought it was, uh, it was a joke, I mean, uh, an unpleasant joke, but, but uh, mostly the work of, of a clown. So I didn't, I didn't really take it seriously. Mm. And then, uh, phone calls started coming in. Um, journalists uh, sending emails, basically intimating me to, to respond and to respond immediately. Um, uh, some of uh, the emails uh, were rather formulated in a quasi inquisitorial manner, pretty aggressive. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, that's when I understood that it was not a joke, mm -hmm. that it was something else. I tried to keep as calm as I could and I answered as politely as uh, I could answer. Uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the process, um, then came a point where almost every day uh, my name was uh, did appear in one German newspaper or another. Uh, 
all of this during the, the confinement. This was the, uh, the very uh, first weeks of the confinement because of COVID in South Africa. Then uh, as um, the drama kept unfolding, <clears throat> a number of colleagues in Israel, many of whom I have never met, uh, but who unbeknown to me had been following my work, decided to intervene and to write to the German Minister of Interior uh, asking him to dismiss the uh, federal bureaucrat who um, had been enlisted by a local politician mm -hmm. in what was clearly a, a, a political cabal. The um, controversy did not originate from academia. Um, these were not uh, colleagues of mine, academic scholars, uh, having studied the works, who then decided to uh, criticize me. This was a local politician whose name uh, I can't remember now. Felix Klein, who, I think, yeah. Yes, who enlisted a federal bureaucrat, meaning a specific arm of the German state to go after me. And um, I doubt that he would be able to pronounce my name correctly. And he was accusing me of something extremely serious. So the controversy became international. Mm -hmm. um, it, it went beyond the borders of Germany. A number of German colleagues intervened in it um, at their risks, because uh, this is not a, a joke in Germany. At the end, you ask me how I experienced this. At the end, I understood that this was not really about me. Um, there's no way in which this could have been about me. Um, I think that, of course, I'm not, I'm not a citizen of Germany. I mean, I, I, I don't go where people don't invite me. In fact, I decline 80, 85% of the invitations I get. So I'm not an intruder. Mm -hmm. But uh, I live in South Africa. I don't live in Germany. I don't live in Europe. I don't live in America. I live in my own continent. It is my own continent that is the, uh, the ground from which I try to make sense of a world which belongs to all of us. It does not only belong to Europeans. Mm -hmm. I respect Germany. I have the utmost respect for its institutions and its people, but I'm not responsible for some of the historical uh, dramas that happened in Germany. So I don't understand why I would be used as a, a pawn in a terrible discussion about a terrible part of the history of Germany of which I'm not part of. In fact, I come from a place that was a German colony. We won't go into the details of what the Germans did in my own country during the 30, 34 years during which they were present there. So Germany, Europe invented two 
demons. The demon of anti-Semitism and the demon of colonial racism. I don't think that the way we'll build a just world is by playing one against the other. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, I have moved on. And uh, in my letter, uh, which you cited, I oh. left it to Germany to deal with its own problems. It doesn't, Germany doesn't need me uh, to deal with it. And I trust that they, they will be able to, to deal with them uh, uh, in a way that uh, uh, makes our world a more habitable place. Mm -hmm. That's what my fight has been about. That's what my thought has been about and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the interesting point in Germany, this discussion became a kind of, uh, you could say, dialectical discussions about two ways of, of thinking the world. One way which is very centered on the European uh, history and another way that is centered more on a, what is called the post-colonial way to like link, for example, colonial violence, re-import of, of, of violence in the first and the second world war, inner European imperialism and the neoliberal system of today. So to have a more, let's say, a global historic view of, of what could happen. And on the other hand, you have, and I think it's on the one hand, a very useful and beautiful concept that is uh, very far from, from, from your thoughts, which is the Western European concept of the guilt of the national socialism and the violence that happened in this specific time. And I think this was mixed in a quite, in a quite strange way during the the, your affair or the affair around you, besides the fact that, of course, it started as a political cabal, you know, as to try to dismiss somebody from, um, from a festival. Um, what, what for me uh, is interesting, because we were uh, discussing before about uh, COVID-19, and I was, uh, when I read about this affair in the newspaper, I remember it was three weeks after, or two weeks after the lockdown. So really in the beginning, when many people was quite utopic that we would leave behind this kind of cabal, you know, and perhaps enter to a state of another consciousness of what has to be done. How do you think about uh, what changed COVID-19? Are you more like Slavoj Žižek on the utopic side? You see kind of first glimpses of a socialist society or more like uh, Giorgio Agamben that you see the House of biopolitics growing, of, of uh, general control, of closing borders, of new nationalism. So how do you think this, this, this pandemic? But I think it is the, uh, first of all, we are not out of it. Um, yeah, that's true. Eh? We, we keep thinking and acting as if it was behind us. It is not. If anything, it is ahead of us. And therefore, the, um, the talk about post-COVID might apply to certain parts of the world. But my feeling is that uh, um, for other important parts of our world, uh, that is uh, not exactly the case. But more importantly, it, it is still ahead of us because the, um, um, what actually brought it about, the ways of uh, relating to the earth that made it possible those ways of relating to the earth are still with us. They are still going on. If anything, there is an acceleration of those manners of uh, uh, relating to our biosphere, which have produced COVID. COVID, COVID is not a spontaneous creation. It is something we have produced through, for instance, um, 
the intensification of deforestations uh, through the uh, ways in which we have treated animals, farming them uh, for destruction. That logic, we haven't put a, an end to it yet. So if anything, um, it seems to me that uh, COVID has not one future, but many, many futures. So does it mean that nothing can be done? Certainly not. Uh, it means that uh, more than ever before, we are called upon, when I say we, I use that term purposefully. We the humans, that we the human race, for those who are fond of such categories, mm -hmm. we are called upon to revisit our ways of uh, inhabiting the planet. Because if we do not share it as equitably as possible, and when I say share it, it means share it amongst ourselves and with others or its inhabitants, if we do not share it as equitably as possible, if we do not render it habitable for all, then I'm afraid our story on earth might uh, be extremely tumultuous. Mm -hmm. But uh, you said it in the beginning of, of, of your answer that uh, the capital system is even accelerating at the very moment, that there are no, somehow perhaps I'm mistaken, no signs that this term to make it, to share it more, to, 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 to render it in a different way, to, um, to change our way to treating the earth and to treating ourselves as, a, as mankind, that's not, really, that's not really happening. I mean, wh where do you see signs of the possibility to make this shift? I have the feeling that there is, um, I don't know how to qualify it, but there is some kind of emerging consciousness, a consciousness, form of consciousness, which is not universal in the sense in which we have understood that term, at least since the 18th century, because the universal uh, was uh, to a large extent, the European universal, it was not the pluriversal, a number of thinkers, especially from Latin America, have been talking about. Mm -hmm. The universal uh, understood from within the imperial framework uh, was the equivalent of colonialism. The extension, expansion beyond Europe of its modes of seeing, modes of being, uh, and it's uh, uh, demeaning of anything that was not uh, uh, its own, uh, along a purely Hegelian, uh, let's see, uh, framework. That, that, that is what was understood by the universal, very authoritarian uh, kind of uh, impulse uh, that uh, didn't at all allow for a dialogic, uh, if you want, intercultural exchange mm -hmm. of the kind we absolutely need now. And once again, not only between humans, but with the living, and we call it in French, le vivant, with mm -hmm. the totality of, of, of the living. So what I was saying is that we see emerging here and there um, a kind of new, I would call it planetary consciousness. A planetary consciousness that uh, is uh, a form of consciousness that is coming uh, deeply in collision with uh, certain forms of national, national chauvinism uh, 
different forms of, uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, attachment to, to difference, attachment to small differences. Uh, so we have seen uh, elements of that emerging planetary consciousness also in a number of uh, recent struggles against racism in general, mm -hmm. and in particular anti-black racism, the origins of which are to be uh, uh, found uh, uh, at least uh, uh, from the time of uh, the Atlantic slave trade. So, so it seems to me that here and there, uh, they are elements that might uh, be building blocks or, or, or building points for uh, a work that is colossal, but that is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. You have in, uh, in your term of necropolitics, you exactly describe in a, let's say, less utopic way, uh, the way of functioning of our time since, as you say, 500 years, perhaps, but also in the neoliberal age as a economy and ecologically of segregation, of separation, of border regime, of racism and how racism and capitalism is linked one uh, to the other. On the other hand, I think it was in a, in a, in a discussion you had uh, lately, I think, I don't remember where it was or, or an interview where you were focusing on ways out of the necropolitics of our time and you described the role of, of the continent of, of, of Africa, a continent that you often describe uh, as a possible laboratory of social and philosophical alternatives of the 21st century. How, how could you explain a bit more about this utopic concept of, of, a, of a kind of an exit of the necropolitics of our time? Let me say one or two words about uh, necropolitics and then I'll move to, yeah. uh, let's see the very important uh, question you, you, you are asking me. As many of, of uh, our listeners uh, might, might know, um, a huge part of the, um, the discussion on the politics of life over, I would say the last 20 or more years has been centered around the concept of biopolitics, which is a concept which has been developed by a number of uh, thinkers, in particular, uh, Michel Foucault. The idea was uh, that, uh, at least in Foucault's uh, narrative, uh, that we modern societies have entered in a new period when our conception of sovereignty has changed. It's no longer about uh, putting to death as such. It's about <clears throat> letting live and letting die, mm -hmm. which Foucault uh, understood to <clears throat> epitomize what he called biopolitics. Giorgio Agamben intervened powerfully in that discussion when among many other things, he became interested in the ways in which modern liberal democracies have uh, tended to turn the ex what should always be the exception, turn it into the normal, normalizing the exception, the state of exception, that which was always meant to be provisional. Now it has become, uh, let's see, the, uh, the, our condition, the normal ways of things. The term necropolitics as uh, I put it forward 
I think kind of 2003 or 2005, was meant to uh, do a different kind of work. It was not about that which relates to the state of an exception. I wanted to account for those trajectories in which uh, making it almost impossible for certain categories of people to live was, has always been the norm. It's not new, it has always been like that. The creation of landscapes of premature death, if you want. Racialized forms of power, which operate in such a way as to make life unlivable as a matter of principle for certain categories of people usually people who are racialized, who are assigned to the uh, prison of race. So necropolitics, that is what it refers to. Then there are all these institutions and dispositives and apparatuses that function precisely along those lines to produce, to make it make life unlive, unlive, environments uninhabitable and hospitable. And uh, the argument I was then making a little later with critique of black reason was that uh, these forms of rule which used to be applied to blacks they are now being generalized. They are now being applied to more than blacks. And I was calling it the uh, becoming black of the world in the sense that uh, racial, racialized forms of rule were no longer just uh, the, privi the privilege in very ironic sense uh, of us. Now we share it with more than us. And that's how I was describing, let's see, the racial kernel of neoliberalism. Now, you ask a huge question. How do we get out of this? Of course, I mean, you don't expect me to say in two, one, two minutes. No, no, I was, I was especially interested in by, uh, by you quoting uh, many times Africa as a continent of the future, together with yes. in Sartu. So this is a, a perspective that is especially interesting for me. Yes. It's like if there is a story where Europe brought us in and Africa can lead us out, so yes. to say. OK. Um, let me put it like this. You know, the, uh, I was trying to take seriously the, um, the fact that when I, mean, I was born here in Africa, I studied abroad, worked abroad, came back, I mean, I go back and forth. I have a little bit sense of what our world, I mean, looks like and, uh, mm -hmm. but, 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 I'm based here and I travel a lot in the continent. There are two things I find absolutely striking whenever I travel in Africa. The first thing is that whenever you arrive, you land in one or the other of the big cities of the continent, I mean, Lagos, uh, we are told it's 20 million people. So it's not a small town. It's not a city like in Europe. It's an entirely different form of cityness, if you want. Mm -hmm. 20 million people. You land in Kinshasa in the Congo. 
millions of people. You go to Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, millions, or Dakar, the same thing. Whenever, or Nairobi for that matter, or even here in Johannesburg, which is one of the, uh, the biggest modern urban forms in, in, in this continent, the number of people who are busy repairing something is absolutely astonishing. <laughs> So it's a massive fact of everyday life. And for sure, something must be going on in these constant permanent acts of re repair, or if you want, of reparation. Some forms of knowledge must be invented in the process through which people are constantly trying to put back together that which has been broken, whether intentionally or not. And it strikes me the extent to which the earth, our planet is in need of repair, of care and of maintenance. So the Intuition is that for sure there must be something to draw from these sets of practices which are also forms of knowledge, which are also the uh, building block for some other form of politics or of the political. So it's an intuition. The second thing which strikes me, speaking from here, living here, traveling throughout the continent, is the extent to which Africa is, uh, let me just call it a power in reserve. Une, <laughs> une réserve de puissance mm -hmm. uh, in French. It is both une puissance en réserve and une réserve de puissance, the two things together. Yeah. And a lot of this is to be found in the forms of inhabitation of the world we have developed over many, many centuries. Because we tend to forget that, I mean, the human, It's here that the human was born. L'Afrique est le pays natal de l'humanité. I don't know how to translate it in English. And if indeed we are le pays natal de l'humanité, for sure, this means something. It means we are the oldest, the oldest forms of the human are to be found here and yet the youngest forms of the human too. That by the end of this century, the youngest, the biggest number of young people on earth will be found here. So it's a, a set of elements like that, which in fact we have been working with in the Atelier de la Pensée, you mentioned it in Dakar. Uh, which we think should uh, becoming in any case the object of uh, our critical thinking. And that's what is our obsession. Our, it's not, I mean, <laughs> putting different memories on a scale, on a hierarchy in order to say what form of memory is more important it has nothing to do with that. Mm. It has to do with the futures of life, the futures of reason, if you want, in a planet that is in dire need of repair. That has been the obsession and that's the project, the intellectual, political, as well as artistic project we are invested in. Mm -hmm. 
what you mean uh, political and as well artistic project because both ways seem quite difficult to me you describe in all your work the a world in the hands of transnational uh, players like big for example raw material firms in in the congo we will have the next uh, school of resistance about this and for me the big question is how is resistance possible how can we get again for example processes of the earth how can we be connected to it again when you see for example in the eastern of the congo you have whole parts of the country that are even not in the hands of the of the of the of the of the congolese government but of for example glencore or the big mining companies so we are confronted to a to a, to an antagonism to a to a structure of a world that which makes acting very very difficult you understand what i mean so how can you how can you develop this 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 kind of problem to come into this from this political or artistic or intellectual project to to direct action? Part of what I see, I mean, when I travel in the continent, is the extent to which the forces that you are uh, referring to. Um, and they are extremely powerful. I mean, we cannot fool ourselves. These are not only local forces, it's the combination of local forces and transnational forces, which are, uh, uh, um, have a hold on territories. They have a, a hold on uh, what is on the surface of these territories, but also on what is underground, mm -hmm. the, the minerals, uh, most of which are critical for the, um, let's say, the daily uh, life of, of uh, the kind of capitalist system we live in. So these are extremely powerful forces. These are also deadly forces in the sense that uh, they do not hesitate to, to kill, to kill nature, to kill individuals, to brutalize uh, uh, the poor and the weakest in particular. But these are also forces, forces of extraction and predation, predatory, extractive. These are also forces which operate in such a way as to cripple the imagination, to paralyze the capacity, all kinds of capacities, beginning with the capacity, what my friend Arjuna Padurai has called the capacity to aspire. So if one is interested in a long-term struggle to regenerate life in all its forms, one starting point is to make sure that uh, we recover some of those capacities, beginning with the capacity to aspire, to imagine something else, that life can be organized in an entirely different manner, beginning with life in small communities. So the question is, where do you go looking for those models? In what kind of archives? Archives in, yeah, as a concept, in the big sense of, of the term. And that's where you, in fact, there is so much in the African archive very few of it has been, let's say, put to work or put to use mm -hmm. in every sense of the term. In terms of, for instance, the natural life of a forest, for instance, in terms of water, in terms of the air we breathe, in terms of the atmospheres, the knowledge about all of that, the, the immense treasure, which is, so how do we recover that, 
those repressed or knowledges or those knowledges that have been somewhat forgotten, how do we reconstitute them and disseminate them, uh, make of them, uh, let's say, an object of, of wide share? Mm -hmm. And to what extent is it that this force us to rethink what critical thinking is all about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a set of acts, actions or gestures of positions like that in which a number of us are involved in. And one can see how little by little, people who were in a state of despair begin to believe in themselves and in their own capacities to enact uh, gestures that help to protect life and uh, to put, bring to an end, let's say the, uh, what are called uh, premature death. Premature death and necropolitics. We have now uh, two questions from the, from the, from the public. Um, Everybody is invited to ask questions through Facebook or the email address you saw in the beginning. Um, so one, one is a quite interesting question we are discussing now in Europe since some years and uh, lead up to some new laws. The question of the reparation and giving back uh, stolen uh, art during colonialism. So the archives, the museums, that they should be opened as Benedict Savoir, our common friend is, for example, very strongly in it. And I think we signed a letter a year ago before COVID about this question. So what do you think about this? Because there are, of course, two positions. One position that say, okay, uh, let's give it back all. It's stolen art. And uh, another position who could claim uh, somehow museums are uh, spaces that are outside, are universalistic and are outside this uh, uh, logic of capitalism. So uh, what's your point about it? Um, I think that uh, restitution is unavoidable. Um, it has to happen. It has to happen, although we know very well that <clears throat> what we lost during the encounter with the West is priceless. What the West took away from us, the West will never be able to give it back because the losses we suffered are by definition, incalculable. Even if the West wanted to pay back, it wouldn't be able to. Because the value of what it took, what it destroyed, cannot be counted. So for me, uh, the question then is, how will we learn to live with that a radical loss. That we are somewhat forced to live with it, although we don't choose to live with it. But we'll have to live with it. And in return, the West will owe us a debt of truth. What strikes me the most with, um, here, here I am talking about the West as, as if such a thing existed. Mm -hmm. but, but, but since it's the vocabulary everybody seems to understand, okay, let's use it at least provisionally. What strikes me the most is the inability to honor the truth. especially when it comes to people the West has defeated. 
It doesn't believe that it owes the truth to those who have lost in a battle. So, I mean, if we want to, and I think that that is the reason why to answer the question that was on the title of our conversation, that's the reason why basically it is uh, not open to other forms of quote unquote universalisms. Mm -hmm. And yet we are reaching very fast a phase of the history of the humans on earth requires an entirely different, let's say, politics. And uh, that entirely different form of the political for it to open up a future for all will have to be premised on reparation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so. a responsibility, obligation to repair that which we have broken. I think the, the West, to, to use this concept of France or Germany, they are afraid to restitute art, for example, because it would open a long chain of, you know, like remaking the past and remaking the, the radical loss, which is, which is somehow impossible. And that's, I think, the big part of the paranoia of the West. And another part, in my opinion, is that uh, they are afraid of a non-European universalism or of a universalism that includes Europe, but where Europe is only a province. And I have a quite interesting question, uh, a long one. I will read it out from the, from the, from the chat, from the public. The question is, the notion of planetary consciousness is quite interesting. I wonder about the role of racialization when it comes to this non-Western universalism. Would you say that it is necessary to overcome race in order to think on a non-Western universalism? Uh, and then adding, I'm saying this because, for instance, when it comes to indigenous cultures in America, what assigns some kind of political agency is precisely the exacerbation of a form of radical, of racial identity, which seems to see to be one of the traps of neoliberalism. You, you understand this uh, question? I could express it well, okay. I, I mean, I, I, think I, I think I understand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, if Try I don't, to it out correctly. then I will be forgiven, I'm sure. <laughs> um, You see, there was a, okay, let me, let, first of all, one, one quick uh, thing about this concept of planetary consciousness. Uh, I, I, I think it's much more, um, um, let's say, uh, productive than the concept of universalism. And I, when we started talking, I, I uh, put forward a kind of uh, uh, quick critique of uh, uh, universalism uh, and I opposed it to um, an idea coming from our colleagues from Latin America, which has to do with what they call pluriversalism, mm -hmm. uh, which means the multiplicity of forms of, uh, uh, so uh, understand. But uh, even the concept of pluriversalism, um, I'm not sure that uh, uh, I, I'm fully satisfied with it. Um, I prefer the idea of the planetary or, or to put it even more uh, um, directly, the idea of the earthly, earthly, that which is of the earth, that which originates from the earth and that which ultimately um, is restituted to the earth. So this double movement of origination and restitution, mm -hmm. that which ends up 
whether it likes it or not, ultimately ends up returning to the earth. It seems to me that that's the moment we are in. The moment of the earth, the, the moment when the earth occupies center stage in a historical project or process that is not only social any longer as Dipesh Chakrabarti has shown, it is still social, but not only. It is geological because now social history can no longer be separated from geological history. It is cosmological in the sense that we have now entered a vibratory um, moment when everything reverberates against everything else. So we are far beyond the universal, strictly understood. So it's along that direction that I would like to, uh, let's see, not respond to the question that was posed, but reflect with the, uh, the person who, who asked it. Mm -hmm. So now if indeed the uh, injunction is an earthly injunction, if our condition, we finally recognize that it is an earthly condition, we imagine these vexing question of identities. What form of identities? We don't have the time to go through every single details, but I am afraid that uh, under neoliberalism, identity might have become the new opium of the people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that's a polemical statement, <laughs> which might land me once again into trouble. <laughs> In which case I'll come immediately to you <laughs> to save me from <laughs> from the competitive narcissism of identities. I will never save you from that, Ashir. <laughs> there is one more, one more, and I think one last question as we uh, have slowly to close this wonderful debate. Um, um, what do you see as the source uh, of the West's underlying fear of reparations and uh, by proxy the public recognition of shared past in more than a superficial gesture? So why can't we transform competitive memory to a kind of a pluralistic memory politics? Why is this so difficult? I mean, to come back also to the beginning of our debate, why people want to compare this violence to that violence? Why not accept that they both exist in their, in their horrible brutality? Look, Milo, if, if, if only I knew, <laughs> you would be the first <laughs> person I would share it with. <laughs> but but I absolutely, since I have no clue, I don't know <laughs> at all. But I know one thing. I know that <clears throat> the right to memory is a right we have to hold on to. And I put it in those terms. I put it in terms of a right to memory. Because I come from a people whose memory has been in a number of instances erased. I put it in terms of the rights to memory 
because the fact of memory is one of the ways in which we become human. It is one of the modalities through which we turn the world into a habitable place, mm -hmm. a place that is open, a place of refuge for everybody. So that right to memory has to be extended to everybody. That's something I know. And I know it from our experience. Experience of colonialism and slavery and what comes after. A second thing I know, <clears throat> which comes from that uh, history, is the fact that we need to share memories, let's say traumatic memories, defeated memories. There's a way to share them. And sharing them does not at all mean putting them on a scale with some on top, others at the bottom in a hierarchical mm -hmm. and a, a form a kind of zero sum game. Yeah. There's no zero sum game in terms of those memories of human suffering. So the point third is that if we want to go forward, if we want to move forward, we'll have to somewhat, some way, somewhere, imagine forms of solidarity between all memories of human suffering. That's how we will build a world that is habitable, where everyone has a place, not the kind of world which is the dominant one, where the moment I have a place, the result is your being expelled, evicted, and so forth and so on. And we need people to work in that direction. Otherwise, um, I don't know what will happen. In any case, many of us won't, be, won't even be there any longer. No. Thank you, uh, Ashil, for this uh, wonderful end. Um, and thank you to the public for the questions. I, I, I couldn't ask all of them, but I think we had a, yeah. We came uh, beginning with the question of the Ashim Bimbe affair to the more general thoughts back to it, somehow perhaps even to a glimpse of a, of a possible solution of a possible dialogue. So thank you so much to uh, having accepted our invitation and for your thoughts, Ashil. And uh, the next uh, School of Resistance has the title A Global Jurisdiction for a Global Economy and will host a lawyer and vice legal director of the European Center of Constitutional and Human Rights, Miriam Sage Maas from Germany, and the lawyer and chief investigator of the Congo Tribunal, Silvestre Bisimba, to speak about global economic justice, uh, especially in regard to the mining industry in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So a uh, logic next step in our, in our discussion, I think. So thank you again, Ashil, for having thank shared you. your thoughts thank with you. us. Thanks. And um, thanks to all our co-producers, especially the Steirische Herbst.